So I, I'm, I'm starting with a formal talk using a script. I'm then going to take you on my virtual tour of South East London churches and a few Sussex churches where I'm going to extemporise and then I'll come back to my script for a small part of the talk at the end. Hans Feibusch. As painter of portraits, landscapes, animals, a sculptor, commercial artist, book designer, lithographer, as painter of civic and ecclesiastical murals, and as well writer on mural painting. Hans Feibusch was probably one of the most prolific and talented 20th century artists there ever was. Caveat, a lot of people have never heard of him, with the exception, I am sure, of my esteemed audience today. It is a little bit hard to understand why. Born in Frankfurt am Main, his father was a dental surgeon, his mother an amateur artist. In 1916, Hans Feibusch was fighting on the Russian front. He later turned to making art and that became his career. In the early 1930s, his art group, unbeknownst at first to the members, contained a Nazi spy. In 1933, he and the other Jewish members were ordered to leave the group. And fearing encroaching Nazi persecution if he stayed in Germany, he came to England in the same year with Sidoni, his wife-to-be. During the Second World War, until about 1944, he worked as a London ambulance driver and he never returned to his native land to live. Now you can see a portrait of him when he was aged 32 and then in terms of the adorability stakes, the other portrait of him when he was just a little bit older, about three years before he died. And this is the studio in St John's Wood where he worked for about 60 years. His early artistic career epitomizes the continental profile of the early 20th century artist. Studying art in Paris, then working under the influence of the German Expressionists. Feibusch also studied in Italy and no doubt looked at the work of the frescoes of artists like Giotto, Masaccio and Piero della Francesca. The 1930s art scene in Britain did not possess quite the same avant-garde edginess as on the continent. But as you will see in this talk, he showed a remarkable ability to adapt to a local aesthetic while bringing his dynamic and distinctive style to his subjects. In a sense, Feibusch had to eschew modernist art for something altogether more restrained, a bit sombre and well, just a bit British. Once in England, after a short sojourn in Brighton, he became a commercial artist, designing posters for companies like Shell. He had exhibitions at the Lefebvre Gallery and joined the London Group. He was then to become a painter of some 40 murals in Britain, more than any other artist in this country achieved. In 1965, he was baptised into the Church of England, but left it formally in 1992. Despite by then being in the UK, a work he had executed in Germany called Two Floating Figures, was included in the degenerate exhibition of July 1937 in Munich to frame art that was not purely classical or realist, or what the Nazis thought of as art. Feibusch's work was displayed in the category called the revelation of the Jewish racial soul, whatever that means. Here was a brazen show of so-called bad, barbarous, stupid art which included a work by Feibusch as one who sought to destroy the values of Western civilization. But he went on to make powerful dramatic Christian narratives, restoring color, hope and light and helping to rebuild many a bombed out church. Feibusch was a creator, not a destroyer. And while not wishing to suggest for a moment that we are led like sheep when it comes to what art to look at, a number of his ecclesiastical murals are in South East London, but one might not readily think of visiting. Four, brick, plain, unadorned 1950s churches 
have much to compete with in a city full of the celebrating classicizing designs of Christopher Wren and Nicholas Hawksmoor. These latter churches have domes, spires, pediments and extravagant features. In some of the churches where Fybush painted murals, the focus was often on post-World War II rebuilding as quickly as possible and making sure there was a portal, an altar, four walls and windows. If I sound a little harsh, I don't mean to. These churches have a lovely architectural language. And as open and airy spaces, they are the best location for a mural painter who liked colour. And as all painters, light. So if we had been told that Hans Feibusch was a mural painter of unprecedented genius or a divine figure sent from God like Michelangelo, as described by the legendary art historian Giorgio Vasari, or that he was the greatest of painters, then I think more of us here today would have already got on a London bus to visit his murals in places like Welling, Eltham, Shooters Hill. The obituaries of Feibusch mentioned his work at St Alban the Martyr in London, as well as in Goring by Sea in Chichester, but no other murals in London or the rest of the country. And these ones I've just mentioned are the best known. So art history can be as much about what we are told to see as much as the seeing. And words about art and our artists can be compelling. Put simply, Feibusch deserves to be better known. But other things other than a paucity of words can conspire against artistic status and the creation of a reputation. For Feibusch, it may have been because he had a split European adult life. He was a German Jewish painter escaping the Nazis. He painted during a brutally austere time in England after the war. And southeast, southeast London churches, themselves often brutally destroyed, were painful reminders of the recent past. Yet he was painting abundantly from 1938 to 70 till failing eyesight forced him to switch to making sculpture. Taking Feibusch into longevity requires more words about his art, as does more viewing. So to set the scene for our tour today, his first mural was at St Wilfrid's Brighton, and then in London, the 1937 foot washing at the Methodist Hall in Collier's Wood. He then offered to restore southeast London churches after the war, some of which were paid for by the War Damages Commission. He would have had assistants, and we know some of them were women, so this lovely photograph here of Feibusch in his boiler suit and cap, no doubt talking to Phyllis Bray, one of the assistants, while looking at a mural, and she was a painter in her own right. It is worth just mentioning other people we might think of too when we think of Feibusch. Let us think of him as a German Jew painting in churches. Let us think too of Nikolaus Pevsner, a German Jew writing about churches in his rather legendary corseted way. There was also the influential Bishop George Bell, who you see here, who met Feibusch in the, in the 1940s through the agency of Kenneth Clark then director of the National Gallery. Bishop George Bell promoted the making of murals and churches, pushing back against conservative communities who had got used to mural-less churches. Rebuilt Victorian churches, restored and modified in their mind's eye of the medieval, were full of colour and decoration. But there was less focus on the instructional image at the high altar and yet despite the ravages of iconoclastic whitewashing, many recently revealed murals show there is a strong legacy from the medieval period of murals in English churches. This is an example of the crucifixion, 14th century in Suffolk. Then there is Thomas Ford, who is here, second in from the right, architect of many of the 1950s churches, also engaged to rebuild bombed ones and who himself lived in Elton, which is one of the areas we go to today. We, we are longing to point out to you the fact that this man beside us, and I'm sure a lot of you have recognized, is Frankie Howard, 
Um, I've only just discovered that Frankie Howard um, went to school in Shooter's Hill. And there's another connection to him, which I'll come um, to tell you about later. And this is Hans Feibusch. Essentially, there was a strong collaboration between architect and Feibusch as interior designer. In his book on mural painting, Feibusch writes at length about thinking of the space when designing murals. By 1943, the artist also belonged to a small group that met at the Bishop's Palace at Chichester to discuss the role of the church in the artist, including members such as T.S. Eliot and Dorothy Sayers. So I am interested in the transformation of this avant-garde German artist into a painter for the church. We might note, for example, that he always got the main gig in the church. That is to say, this adorable diminutive man who you will encounter in, in interview on YouTube went straight to the high altar or the ceiling. No messing around in a side aisle or a hidden away chapel to start with. He became a mural for the main Christian message of salvation in a brave new world. So before I, I take you through the churches, I'm just going to introduce you to a few salient points about his art, which I hope will carry you through. So the main subjects are Christ's beginnings from the nativity to his final passion, the crucifixion scene and resurrection and ascension and then the triumph of salvation in the Christ in glory theme. So Christ's end days and our lives ever after. The murals were made with a variety of paint but some using his favourite stick bee paint. This was a French product which had been used by post-impressionist artists such as Maurice Denis from 1927. Otherwise, he may have used simply house paint. Though the one I'm showing you now from St Alban the Martyr in London was made in oil. Some of the murals were directly applied to the plaster on the wall, but some were applied to boards first. I want to talk about his figure types. They are bold, they are gestural, they have bold limbs. They can also, though, appear vulnerable to reflect the fragility of humanity. I think this is a brave thing to do when these images were designed to proclaim the faith. Their facial expressions can hit you in the stomach. They can feel quite visceral. Feibusch does not shy away, as you can see here, perhaps, from expressing disbelief or despair. He put human responses at the heart, and neither is he afraid of painting nudity, quite a lot of it. He also brings to his murals the odd quirky iconographical feature. Something I've noted in particular are that there are often in these religious scenes a lot of witnesses, more than I have seen in Renaissance frescoes or Renaissance art, for example. He does, as I think you can see here, brave things with colour. We have very vivid colour palettes. We have stronger colours, often in close juxtaposition with paler colours. A rainbow palette, perhaps. Sometimes he does bold passages of paint, which look either as if they're niches, background painted niches for the figures, or pure abstract passages of paint. And I've noticed in his art quite a few really wide open mouths. I think that's very distinctive. Finally, and perhaps more um, worryingly, there is the legacy of the narrative of destruction with some of Feibusch's art and yet survival against the odd. So while some vilified his, his art in the 1950s, viewing it as too new and bold, and some people saying, isn't he going to mix the colours in? Others must have found his art a breath of fresh air after the war. So the only virtue I carry to sit here today, which makes me eligible to speak about Feibusch's murals, for I know that many in, of you in the audience have already found Feibusch, is that I have visited quite a few of the churches where his murals are located. 
I cannot remember how I found them. It's rather like saying to somebody, I have not seen the old mini car on the roads for a while. And then the next day you see seven. Firebush suddenly started to appear everywhere for me. So the aim for today is to take you on a virtual tour. Perhaps you can imagine yourself on a bus. Central London, starting with St Alban the Martyr in Hoburn, moving out southeast way, ending up with St Peter's Bexley Heath, and then staying with our East theme, going down to East Sussex. I've had to practice saying this, but let's make this the beginning of the Finding Fab Fine Bush fan club. So I start with St Alban the Martyr in Hoburn, a mid 19th century church, and a detail of which I've already shown you. This is an image of Christ in glory, and we know that Phyllis Bray worked with him on this. Arms up, arms pushed against the picture plane, hands covering face at the expression of seeing Christ in glory, people turning as if to evoke the turning of the world, heads tilted back, variety with facial types, some are gaunt, some have a real strong angularity, a real muscular quality to them. He is not afraid to depict all the different expressions that people must have felt at witnessing Christ in glory. Just a few details. Here on my left is Christ. You'll see that his arms are stretched out as if the cross is still bearing him. You have above him God the Father. You have to the side of him the Holy Spirit as the dub, but with this interesting, unusual feature of a man as well. To the right of Christ, you can see his arm there, our left, you've got a group of holy figures. This is St. Peter with his key. This, I believe, is, is, is Mary the Virgin, his mother, close to Christ's hand. Here is possibly Mary Magdalene, and then very, very striking, these cripples and beggars right in the same area of the holy figures. Remember the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19. The poor shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Here on the lower ground, or the lower register, you've got a group of ecclesiastical figures. Here apparently is Father McConaughey, who brought Anglo-Catholicism to the slums of London. Note this really striking figure. He looks as though he's in green leggings with his arms outstretched and hands tightly clasped. He is beside St Alban, a detail of which I show you here. St Alban, as the dedicatee saint of the church, Christian soldier, early Christian martyr. He's almost like our entry point or like an actor giving a soliloquy mediating between us as witnesses to Christ in glory and the space within. See here too these, these, these anatomized figures with heads bent, this one whose body is, is half bent over, outside a cage structure, probably a reference to Christ's tomb at the resurrection, but also some say a symbol of the imprisoned soul. See here how he brings so many witnesses together. We've got a, a small group of witnesses right at the, the back, a real throng. Then finally, with this, this vignette here, witnesses who are probably the apostles witnessing lots of different passages of colour. You can see what I mean about the way in which the backgrounds are these wonderful bold streaks, really, but the oranges merging here, the, the yellows, the pinks. And then lucky for St Alban, they've also got a wonderful selection of panels from the Stations of the Cross. I'm not going to dwell on these. Suffice to show you just three from, from the nave that goes round. Here I can, I, I think you can see, partly obviously because um, with a lot of his murals anyway, he's having to paint from a distance. The boldness of the paint, the, 
the boldness of the, the brushwork is, is something that's really striking. Moving now to St John's Waterloo, where we would all be if we hadn't been condemned to purgatory today. Um, you can see this is a 19th century church, classical temple front, but which has modifications in it by Thomas Ford. And here at the high altar is the crucifixion, the first collaboration that Freibusch did with Thomas Ford, a war damaged commissioner's church. And I think what's particularly notable about this scene is the way in which we see these open mouths. It is very, very notable. See John the Evangelist here while pointing to Jesus on the cross, holding Mary, protecting her from swooning. Complemented by this figure here with hands and arms pushed out in both directions, another figure with wide open mouth there. You can really feel the magnitude of the despair of these figures who see the crucifixion. You'll also see, and I, I've, I've blown up the detail of this figure's feet here, that, that he, he paints fate, feet in what I see a lovely naked simplicity. They're quite raw, but I think which brings such a humanity to his works. And notably, um, you can see the signature, Hans Feibusch and the date. Um, if your pictures of yourselves are uh, um, occluding it, you might just move them a bit. Um, here's another little detail of where he puts his signature by feet, but just another detail from that really, really emotional scene of John the Evangelist holding up Mary. And I just thought it was also um, worth mentioning just the other um, wall painting that the um, church are lucky to have. This is a painting of the adoration of the Christ child and I think you will notice the communicativeness with the tilted heads, the, 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 the hands, the gestural hands as they fold in and worship the Christ child. But in the context of mural painting, just very quickly, this, this mural is part of a large cycle of murals that is not far away from St John's Waterloo at Morley College Refectory. A, lo a lovely set of murals by Edward Borden, who was a contemporary with Hans Feibusch. Well, um, the theme here really is survival. You can see that we're looking at a church without a roof. This is the church of All Hallows at Southwark, a mid to late 19th century church, damaged in World War II, but then was rebuilt by Thomas Ford in 1957. However, were I able to take you through this door, a little bit overgrown, and take you into this room, and if I was to take an axe and remove these bricks, I would be able to show you this Feibusch, which, as you can see, is Nolle me tangere. And here it is in its original setting. But sadly, this church was made into a recording studio in the 1980s, and this is the destiny for Feibusch. I think there's an irony to the fact that it is called Don't Touch Me. Of course, it illustrates the scene from the Gospel of John when Mary Magdalene was the first to witness Christ after he had arisen. Jesus said to her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father and to my God and your God. What seems poignant is that the fate of some of Feibusch's murals is a case of demolition or potential destruction similar to what has happened with the medieval murals I've already mentioned. And here are a couple of wonderful drawings of Mary Magdalene and Jesus that the Pallant House Gallery in Chichester, which houses all the contents of his studio and archival material, and note again where he puts his signature. By the way, I don't think there's anything significant in that, if you're thinking I'm thinking that. However, all is not lost because other bricked up Feibusch murals have miraculously revealed themselves, such as we see here at St Mark's in Coventry, 
this was um, unbricked, as it were, in 2017, revealing another wonderful ascension and with a lion roaring, roaring out the joy of it being revealed again. However, if you are tempted to go down to, to All Hallows with your axes and unbrick it, be careful because there's a sign not far from All Hallows saying, commit no nuisance. But if, if um, I'm just going to dwell on this theme of um, destruction and survival a little bit more, just one more interesting insight into Hans Feibusch murals that are hidden now. You can see to the left the, the coloured mural that is presented in, in clearer terms here of the crucifixion. It's St Ethelberger's Bishop's Gate. This was a large central panel accompanied as well on the left by St Luke, the visiting patients, and then St Ethelberger on the right with children. Miraculously, the mural survived the 1993 IRA's bombing unharmed. But to add a twist to fate, after the church was rebuilt in 2002, the mural was panelled over with a grant from Lloyd's of London. And I think this is where it originally was, but I've never seen it. We move now to Holy Trinity in Rotherhithe a rebuilt 19th century church after the war by Thomas Ford. This is Christ on the cross as the, um, it's been called or the crucifixion. You'll see Christ in the center on his cross surrounded by angels. Customarily at the crucifixion, we see John the Evangelist and Mary, as I've pointed out at St. John's, but I think it's notable that here we have three witnesses again, all expressing them, their, their feelings about this in different hand gestures. You'll also note that we have angels floating around at the crucifixion. And I think this is another interesting that Feibusch does. He often brings the celestial and the earthly together. And the vicar at the church told me that he has parishioners who remember watching Feibusch paint this. They clay, claim that he was a quiet and affable man. And indeed the witnesses to the scene by these three figures here, I think he means, were meant to be portraits of local dockers. This church is located very close to the River Thames and where a lot of wharves and little ports were. So that is obviously a wider view of the mural in situ. And then you'll have noticed um, the architectural setting at the background. You might, you might think that this could be Jerusalem. It's a little bit of a, um, a fabrication, but I think it's a lovely architectural vision. We've got classical fronts, we've got spires, we've got steeples, we've got domes, and then a couple of lovely details of domes here and here. We come now to Christchurch Battersea. I, I was going to go and see this church last week, but sadly I couldn't because of lockdown. Another Thomas Ford collaboration. You're going to get very tired of me, me saying this. Um, this is of, sorry, this is of the Ascension of Christ. The scene taken from Acts chapter one, 40 days after the resurrection, depicting Christ's last appearance to the apostles. It says in the narrative, he is taken up to heaven in a cloud. Well, of course, Hans Feibusch puts him against this, this bold painterly passage, which I've mentioned before. There's no obvious cloud here, except for perhaps a little bit there. The narrative from Acts also mentions two men or two figures in white. I can see one there, but really I don't know if it's meant to be this figure. Look at this fascinating drawn figure. Look how anguished he looks. 
But look too at the figures floating around. If they're angels, where are their wings? Look how loosely clothed they are. I think Feibusch has got real guts with painting figures, but look too at this bare-breasted figure here, a detail of which is there. We now go to St. James Merton, which I mentioned earlier, Thomas Ford. The picture here depicts the resurrection, which of course is featured in all four gospels. In this wall painting though, we have also Nolly Métangeré on the left and the road to Emmaus on the right. You can see here Christ who's just emerged from his tomb. He's surrounded by these two sleeping soldiers. Now there is no mention of soldiers in the Gospels except in Matthew, but if you, if you know scenes from the resurrection throughout the whole history of Western painting, you'll often find sleeping soldiers referred to as the watch. So they're sleeping witnesses, as it were, to Christ coming out of his tomb. However, you'll also have noted, I'm sure, that Christ has got his eyes closed. He looks asleep. And I think that's very brave because perhaps we're more used to a more triumphant image of Christ's resurrection from the tomb. Here he is standing triumphantly on the tomb. Here he is with his wide open eyes. At least, though, he's not tramping on the soldiers as we see him here. Now, you may wonder why his eyes look closed here, following on from what I've just said. Well, if the likelihood is that this was coloured, I think that would have made his eyes look more open. And I've also been very, very lucky to have been given this letter, or a copy of it, I should say, that Hans Feibusch wrote to a Mr. Goodrich at St. James Merton in 1975, so a decade or so after Bible should finish the church mural and it says how you should clean the mural. No soap, a little bit of water, lukewarm water, only to be applied with a soft underlying sponge. It's, an, it's a fascinating insight and then I love the way he says at the end, let me know the result of the operation. We now move to St Barnabas Eltham. This, this church itself has had a fascinating history. It was a mid 19th century church built by George Gilbert Scott, but originally in Woolwich Dockyard. It the, was then moved here, lock, stock and barrel in 1933, but gutted in World War II with some restoration by Thomas Ford. I've recently read that, that Frankie Howard um, used to teach Sunday school at St Barnabas, not all the time I assume, but also the church hall beside this church is called the Frankie Howard Centre. So that explains why maybe Frankie Howard was in that picture, that he may actually have known Hans Feibusch. This is a black and white image of the bombed out church. And here is the rebuilt Thomas Ford Church with a full scale view of the the ceiling at the chancel of the image by Feibusch, Christ in glory. And I just want to, you to just notice these angels here facing east, facing Christ in glory. The father at St Barnabas told me that at the time Hans Feibusch was painting this, the church warden was a man called George Lohman. He only died last year. Anyway, George was there when Hans Feibusch started to paint and he said to the artist that the church really could not afford his painting, to which Hans Feibusch said, don't worry, I will spread the cost on the other murals. So here is a detail of the Christ in glory. I think it's, it's fascinating to see Christ is seated while the angels around him are, are going around floating quite balletic, but note too there's a seated angel who seems to be doing a pose that I recognise from yoga, but might, might we refer to this with a new motif, the seated one. 
just to pick out the angels, now we're looking at them from the front as opposed to the back. It is thought that Hans Feibusch was inspired to paint his angels from these angels. Although I should point out that Pevsner was a little bit condemning of this Thomas Ford interior and said it was restored with a sickly Regency wedding cake interior. Moving on now to All Saints, Shooters Hill. I'll mention that name again, Thomas Ford, another post-World War II rebuilding. Note here too, this, this, this very large window, because it, it, it manages to bring in an awful lot of light into this interior. So the, the, the painting here is the Ascension of Christ. I think what's particularly interesting is the two figures here, these two angels with their backs to Christ. You'll see though that their arms are pushed up. You'll also see that they're just stepping on to the ground, which they're about to share with the apostles who are in this detail here, witnessing the ascension of Christ. So again, it's this really interesting juxtaposition between the celestial and the earthly. And as I've said before, the variety of gestures is very noteworthy. Look at this apostle here kneeling, who's got his hands as if they're about to pray maybe, or maybe they're, they're just releasing themselves from prayer. So the witnesses here, to me, seem to be there looking which becomes our seeing. It's the power with which his figures communicate. We're moving on now to the penultimate church in London. This is St Mary the Virgin Welling, Thomas Ford again. And this church was, as far as I know, purpose built to coincide with the development of new housing districts that had started in the suburbs of London, really from the 20s and 30s. This letter from the Bishop of York congratulates the church on building a new church for the new housing districts. Although Pevsner was less impressed and wrote of Welling, where this church is, it is almost wholly a creation of the 1920s and 30s and his churches match the timidity of the faceless and seemingly endless housing around. That aside, here is his ascension of Christ into heaven. And I won't spend too much time on this now because we've, we've covered a lot of the very human element that I really wanted to bring across to today, but all the different ways in which the apostles as witnesses react. I mean, here's another gesture that we haven't yet seen, where a man or apostle seems to be touching his nose with his hand. And then finally to St. Peter's Bexley Heath. Of course, I think this used to be in Kent, but it is now the London Borough of Bexley. And the, the mural here is of the resurrection with scenes from the life of St. Peter. And given what I've read what Feibusch says about thinking about space with his murals. I also thought it's noteworthy that the, the exterior of the church, as you can see, has a lot of trees around it. Of course, they're a lot bigger now than they would have been when Feibusch was here. But I think he might be thinking about that exterior here, because as you can see, there's, there's quite an extensive foliage and lots of trees with the light falling off them, on them. So moving to Sussex now, and I'm looking at four churches. I'm starting with St Wilfrid's Brighton, which was his first church commission, as I've said, and then I'm going to end at All Saints in Iden. Now, St Wilfrid's Brighton was consecrated in 1933 by Bishop George Bell. He then was instrumental in getting Fybush to paint his picture at St Wilfrid's. I think you can probably tell from this picture, this is no longer a church, it is a housing cooperative. 
although I, am, I have some rather lovely black and white photographs of how the church used to look. And here is the image. What's happened is that they cordoned off the image which used to be in the Lady Chapel of the church. And although it is in a tiny room, it is something that you can visit. So this has been saved. As you can see at the centre, we have the nativity, Mary and the child and Joseph looking on, slightly gormless as he often is, or often actually asleep. And here we have the, these angels who have come to witness on the left, to the left of them in another part of the wall is the adoration of the Magi. To the right is another angel and then to, to her or his right, two witnesses, two mortals who've just come through this arch. They're, they're mystery, mysterious. I think there's a curiosity to these figures that, that Hans Feibusch puts in. Note too that again, I, unusual iconography, where's the ox, where's the ass? And then another arch just beside those other two figures where you see another witness figure, gestural, on the threshold of this arch, separating her from the nativity scene with what is now behind her, the Annunciation to the Shepherds. So I think this, this particular work also shows you just how in inventive he is with not only iconography, but also the composition. And then just to quickly show you the adoration of of the Magi. It's a very cute, almost childlike, fairy-like adoration of the Magi with this lovely horse rather than, I suppose, a camel. Moving on now to St Mary's Goring by Sea. This is a 19th century church, but inside on the chancel arch is Christ in glory. And, and I think here what, what's lovely is to see Christ seated, surrounded by these angels who, who seem to be in this lovely rhythmical ballet with one another, or this one, although this one seems to be a bit of a seated one. If you, if you look at the details of them, some of them really do have wonderfully evocative individual expressions. This one has a sort of expression of lightness about him. Um, demolished not so long ago. This is um, the Church of St Elizabeth's in Eastbourne. It, it used to look like this in this inset, which I hope you can see. It is being rebuilt and this work by Hans Feibusch, The Pilgrim's Progress, has been kept, luckily. There were many, many months where people were not sure what its eventual fate was going to be. So, as you can see, there's a lot of poignancy with a lot of his works, and I, I don't know what is going to happen to it, but I do know people want to have it in a special designated space. But just to say also, so these are some figures from the Pilgrim's Progress, and I haven't seen this, I have to say. I think it's interesting to look at his background settings for some of his figures, because as you can see, there's a lot of foliage. But I think this in many ways anticipates him becoming a sculptor, because there's something very sculptural about these. But also, to me, they look as though they could be in sculpted niches. And then finally, All Saints Iden, a medieval church, essentially, and I'm not ending with a mural, but I'm ending with this um, panel he did, oil on canvas, of the return of the prodigal son. I have chosen to end with this, as I think it's, it's a lovely reminder of the vivid colour palette that we started with at St Alban the Martyr. It is worth noting too that not far away in East Sussex are the Berwick Church murals that Bishop Bell was instrumental in commissioning by Duncan Grant and Vanessa Bell and I, I believe that Hans Feibusch communicated with Vanessa Bell. And just to end with a quote from Hans Feibusch 
from his book, Mural Painting, very applicable to his murals in the churches. He said, the voice of the church should be heard loud over the thunderstorm and the artist should be her mouthpiece as of old. So with a few more plaudits and a few more words, let us start promoting Mr. Fybush. As you all know, Hans Holbein, the famous painter of the Tudor court was essentially German and a muralist, but the British have done a very good job at appropriating him. We can promote Feinbusch while preserving his vital German Jewish background. What an extraordinary legacy he has left us, not only his paintings and sculptures, but the very fact of resurrecting mural painting in churches who seem to know just how to get to the heart of the spiritually momentous moments of Christ's life and afterlife. A profoundly progressive painter, he took on the church wall with bravado and vigour and a perceptive understanding of the pathos of the subjects and how humanity responds. He had been at the cutting edge of modern art, but had the humility and tenderness of spirit to work in many British churches. My last words, well, apart from my thanks, will come from Father Smith at St Albans, who wrote to me, I'm so glad you are championing the great man. So who wants to join the fi Finding Fab Fibush fan club? Um, but finally, my thanks must go to so many people who helped me prepare this talk including Monica Baum Dukan, Beth McCatty and Yukar Gravina, who brought me to this spot sitting in my study. Then Andy Herons, Marie Timms, Paul Worth, Father Christopher Smith, Steve Cook, Paul Shaw, Simon Edmund, Sarah Tobias and Ed Aldred, who were so generous with information and photos and links to photos. And finally, at the last hour, but by no means the last supper, I hope, thanks to the Reverend Paul Kennedy, who sent me this completely wonderful picture by Fybush, and I'm very jealous, which hangs in his rectory at St. Verdast in the city. So thank you very much. Thank you Emma so much for that. Um, and now I think I'm gonna pass over to Beth, the cat and my colleague, who will take up some of the questions that you've written in the chat box so that we can take the conversation from there. And do keep on putting your questions in the chat box, even if we don't get through them all by the end of today. We, we are planning to keep in touch with everyone to keep this research going. So on to you, Beth. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for some great questions. Um, we have a question first from Alison Williams. Uh, where can we see uh, Hans Feibusch's sculptures? Ah, so there, there is St Alban the Martyr in Hoburn, which I started with. There's one of his sculptures there. In fact, didn't I, um, if I bring up here, I think I've put some of them up. Yes, so um, we, we've got St Alban the Martyr, Hoburn. We've got this one um, of St John the Baptist on the right, St John's Wood Preparatory School, and we've also got one by him at Ely Cathedral. There are probably more, Alison, but those are the ones I've located in, in London. So Thanks. I'll stop sharing my screen. Yes, we haven't seen them, but... Oh, you didn't see them. Sorry, do you want me to bring it up again? Do you mind? That would be great. Okay, Thank you. sorry. And um... so, um, yes, here we are. So e um, Ely Cathedral, St. Alban the Martyr Hoburn, this one, St. John the Baptist, uh, what looks like is outside St. John's Wood Preparatory School. And then, um, yes, sorry, this is at Ely Cathedral. And then there's one at St. Alban. So that's four that I know of anyway. And I know that the St. John's Wood, that is the church that he worshipped at um, when he'd converted to um, Anglicanism. And we've got a couple of questions, a um, couple of people, Rachel Kolsky and Paul Newman, have said, do we know why he converted to Anglicanism? 
I I wouldn't like to say, but maybe that's a question for Paul. Yes, we're very lucky, everyone, to have Paul Worth, Hans Feibusch's grandson, with us today. Paul, is that something you can help us with? I think he was influenced by um, the subject matter and some of the clergy he uh, became friends with. Um, but as you've already said, ultimately he reverted to uh, Judaism um, in the last uh, eight or ten years of his life. And Paul, a, relative, a related question to that from Peter Bradley. Did he work for any other denominations? Did he do any work in, in Catholic churches or in any other? Uh, in one or two synagogues. Right. But to my knowledge, no, um, just the Anglican Church, Church of England. And then, of course, his secular works, most notably in Newport Town Hall. Uh, among many, yes. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, and um, a, a question, Emma Rose, that you may be able to, you may even know the answer to. Susan um, Copas has said the Iden mural, the colours look, um, it looks much brighter than some of the others. Do we know what medium that's in? Yes, um, I, 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 maybe I didn't make it clear. I, um, I said it isn't a mural, it's an oil on canvas. Right. Yeah, but um, that's why I ended with that, because I said that it takes us back to the beginning, it takes us back to the oil on, on the wall at St Alban the Martyr. Thank you. And um, with several people, several of us are, are, are keen to know what's happened to the Eastbourne St Elizabeth murals. Um, and I, I know that they've been saved. I gather that they are somewhere in a conservation studio um, awaiting um, conservation. But I think, again, it's a case of, of um, further fundraising before that can happen. Yes, that's what I've so, heard. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, everyone, for comments. We'll be looking at all these carefully afterwards. And if there are any questions we haven't got to today, we'll come back to you. Do feel free to carry on the conversation between yourselves and with us on our on the St John's Waterloo Facebook page. Um, and now I hope I'm going to be able to introduce Giles Goddard, who is the Vicar of St John's. Is he with us? He is. Good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Beth, very much. And thank you to Emma for a really fascinating talk. <clears throat> it's so good to see the range of Fibrous's work all in one place. And I'm hugely grateful that, that that's become possible through your work. So here we are at St John's Waterloo, which is where we were hoping to welcome you. I have a completely empty nave in front of me and I have the wonderful crucifixion behind me. And we also, below the crucifixion, have the nativity scene, which I think includes Fibrous's grandson as one of the models. I think he may have been the baby Jesus. And I just wanted to say that we are really feel incredibly fortunate to have this mural in St. John's. When I came here 10 years ago, it struck me as an odd subject to choose for the Festival of Britain. As you've probably heard, this church was rebuilt for the Festival of Britain in 1951. And this mural was part of the celebration of the skills and artistic creativity, which was happening at the time. And I used to wonder why he'd chosen the crucifixion, especially such kind of dramatic and heartbreaking crucifixion. But I think having lived with it for 10 years, it's become apparent to me that he was reminding us of the pain of the war. He was reminding us, reminding us that in the midst of creation, there is destruction and reminding us of the richness of the story. And it's certainly very good for us to have here at St. John's and particularly on Good Friday, of course, we focus on the crucifixion very strongly. So it's part of our life in all sorts of different ways. It's very good to see so many people on this call and it's good that the network of Fibush fans is developing all the time. And we look forward to seeing more of you over the next few months and years. And we're really grateful for the support and encouragement of Paul Worth, who you've just seen, his grandson and the curator of his work for the last decade of Hans's life and for many others, for the vicars of churches with Fibush murals, collectors and experts and the people who knew him, all those who've come forward recently with knowledge and anecdotes, articles, and indeed Paul's photograph. 
You don't have to have a connection to Flybush to be interested. So do please sign up to our newsletter so that we can keep you informed of the symposium, which you can mentioned early on in March of next year. And if symposium sounds a bit academic, let me reassure you that everyone is welcome and it will be a lot of fun. And just like Plato's symposium, it will involve wine, as long as that's permitted by March of next year. And there'll be a link going around for signing up in the email, which is coming out after this event. And many thanks to those of you who've donated as part of your booking today. This mural behind me is in a parlous state. It's falling apart. If you were here, and if you were standing where I'm standing, you could see that there are white flakes where the paint has begun to fall off the mural. The reason for that is that when it was created, it was created in front of a window. You can see that there used to be a window there. And there's a very thin layer of glass and a thin layer of insulation between the window and the outside, between the picture and the outside world, which, is mean, which means that when it's cold outside, the picture gets cold, and when it's hot outside, the picture gets hot as a result of expanding and contracting all the time, and therefore it's now falling to bits. The cost to restore it is 57,000 pounds. So far we've raised 20,000 with support from the Heritage of London Trust and also the generous support of the Kirsch Foundation. We're very grateful to both those for giving us their support, but we do need another 37,000 pounds. And so I'm going to put in the chat right now, I hope, <laughs> a link. That is the link to our website where you can donate if you haven't donated already. Um, the 37,000 pounds will pay for a new improved insulation behind the picture and also pay for the restoration of the picture so that it can continue to inspire people for the next 50 to 100 years. And it's part of our bigger renovation of the whole church, which is going to cost in total four million pounds, which we're planning so that this landmark building can play an even more central role in the diverse communities of the South Bank, Waterloo and London. So thank you for your donations. Thank you for your interest. And thank you for being with us online. And once we're through the pandemic, you know where we are. We're the big church by the IMAX in Waterloo. And do drop in say hello and come and see our five wishes in the flesh. We'd be delighted to meet you. Thank you. <laughs>